Okay, so last time we were looking at our good dead friend, Tommy Hobbs, as somebody no one, no one called him. And we're looking at his view of you know, first philosophy. And then we press on to looking at his view about epistemology, which is literally the translation of episteme, meaning knowledge, ology meaning study of. So it's the study of what can you know, what are the limits of knowledge, what is knowledge, that type of stuff. So without further ado, let's stop. Now, one of sort of the you know, divisions in philosophy that goes way back is, of course, the rationalist versus the empiricist. And as we saw, rationalists believe that at least some of what you know of what's out there can be acquired by pure reason. The empiricists say, no, that's ridiculous. Whatever you know about what's out there has to come from out there through the senses to get in here. And Hobbes, in terms of where he belongs in those two camps, he belongs in the empiricist camp. And he thinks, this is how it works. And I'll use uh, badly drawn cartoon to illustrate it. So we get a person. And we'll put a brain in there. And it's nice. Now, the way uh, Hobbes sees this working, and this will be, you know, even though Hobbes you know, didn't know about like, you know, neurons and so forth, the basic model is one we still see today. The idea is if someone's looking at an object, say like a cube or something, what would happen is, you know, light would strike it, reflect off, hit the eye, and the way Hobbes, you know, envisioned it, there would be motions, you know, of objects, these materialists. And it would cause motions in the brain, and that's where we get our thoughts. So for him, essentially, everything is physical, and whatever we know about the outside world comes in through the senses and gets into the brain. And this is all, for him, physics. It's all physical objects. Now, of course, we do have sensations. And so this goes back to the distinction between the primary qualities and secondary qualities. So as Hobbes would see it, there really are you know, physical qualities out there, mass, density, volume, et cetera. And those would be the primary qualities. But we also experience secondary qualities, color, coolness, warmness, taste, et cetera. And they are, well, given his view, they'd be motions in the brain. So they're inside the mind. So, so the main points for Hobbes here are this. First, you know, it's all physical. There's no, he's not a dualist, there's no ghosty stuff involved. It's all physical processes. And so even though his understanding of physiology back then would not match what we know today, the basic mechanism is the same. So if you took a class uh, today in that physiology, they'd lay out in great detail like how the nerves work, how the optical you know, the nerve works, how the visual centers of the brain work, etc. And from the theoretical standpoint, you know, it's basically the same as Hobbes. It's all a mechanical process. Now what about imagination and memory? Now, Hobbes is trying to explain those things. And of course, today, in neuroscience and psychology, they still try to explain the same thing. How does imagination work? How does memory work? Now, the view Hobbes takes is one that's commonly held by thinkers during this time. And I'll use my usual analogy. One way you can think of the way empiricism works is kind of like this. Imagine if you will. The mind is like an empty room. And except for, well, it's not entirely empty. You're in the room, in a way. Or you are the room. And then the senses bring in stuff. And to use my crap analogy, it's like there it's like you're in a room sitting there, and there's like openings. And then 
Lego objects, you know, get tossed into the room. So using my, you know, crap analogy, when you see like a bottle, for example, and all the stuff in the room, it's like, you know, assemble that Lego objects are thrown into a room, you're in the room with the, with the objects. Now, what can you do with Legos? Besides sell them on eBay for a lot of money. Actually, Legos are now one of the best investments. Apparently, some Lego sets, their value has increased 200, and I think it's like 2,200%. So it is a big investment. So if someone says to you, I'm not playing with toys, I'm investing, they might be telling the truth. Probably not, though. They're probably just playing with toys. So what else can you do? What can you do with Legos? Suppose you know, go with our, our crappy metaphor. You're sitting in your room, and you have all these Lego assembled things in front of you. What can you do? Yeah, you can take them apart and build different things. And crudely put, that's how kind of the imagination works. Stuff comes in, and you can kind of mentally disassemble it into, into parts and assemble them back together. So for example, and we'll see this later in, in Descartes, if you have an idea of like a human being and a horse, you can combine them and get a centaur, for example. And so for Hobbes, since whatever we get in here has to come from out there, Imagination is just reassembling in new combinations what we have already have taken in. So for someone like Hobbes, you literally cannot, and the other thinkers as well, you can't have an original idea except it being a different combination of things. But of course, that does give us a huge range. Again, going with the Lego metaphor, if you can break things down to the Lego pieces, you're stuck with working the pieces, but there's so many things you can build from. So what about memory? How does that work? Now today, of course, people who do you know, neuroscience and psychology are trying to work out what are, what are the mechanisms of memory. And again, this is a continuation of Hobbes' project. He thought it was all physical, Obviously, back then, they didn't have you know, the sort of technology we have today, so they couldn't get into the fine details of the brain. But it's the same project. How does that work mechanically? Now, Hume's view, no, sorry, uh, Hobbes' view is very similar to the views held by many at this time. The idea is, is that, to use this phrase, memory is decaying sense. And I'll use another metaphor. Suppose you get some pizza, and then you leave the pizza in the refrigerator, and you forget about it, and it gets wedged in the back. What happens to the pizza? Yeah, it starts decaying. <laughs> it starts going bad. And memory is kind of like that. It's like stuff gets stored back in there. And using our, our metaphor, you know, the pizza is not as good as it was originally, because it starts getting you know, decayed. And so what they have to explain about memory, what we still have to explain today, is that it does you know, decay. And so is, you know, using the metaphor, it's kind of like that. Something gets in there, starts decaying. Another metaphor that people have used is like tracks. You know, if there's like fresh mud and somebody or something walks through, through the mud, leaves a clear track. But then of course, as time goes by, the track starts to, you know, sort of fade, fade away, gets worn away. And so memory, or one of the favorite sort of metaphors of this time, is like that. It's like a mark in the, the sand that starts wearing away. Now, we're still trying to work out how this works. Because, well, what's one practical concern about memory these days? Like, what's a disease that attacks memory? Alzheimer's. Yeah, Alzheimer's. And so they're trying to figure out how does our memory work so you can make that, you know, Alzheimer's not, not affect people as much. And one thing that ties directly into philosophy is, one that we'll talk more of this when we get to John Locke and others, is they're working on mechanical memory. So just like today, you have your you know, smartphone, you know, laptop, et cetera, where you store stuff, and it works like an auxiliary memory. What they're proposing is building them right into you know, cybernetics, building it right into your body. So you have like a backup that stores all your information. So if your normal memory is starting to go because of Alzheimer's or injury, you can have a backup right in your, directly into your brain. And then we get into the interesting question of, you know, 
if all your memories are now you know mechanical, are they still your your memories? And then of course you can get into you know cool or not so cool sci-fi movies. Now Hobbes also brings up <coughs> what later became part of the foundation of you know uh, associationist psychology. He notes that we tend to associate things. For example, we have the saying, where there's smoke, there's... I guess it doesn't work anymore. We're, yeah, there's fire. And so we associate smoke and fire. And of course, later, you know, this gives rise to, in part, to associationist psychology, which has its own entry on Wikipedia, as all things do. Okay, so key things for Hobbes here. First, he is an empiricist. Whatever we know about what's out there comes from out there through the senses. Secondly, it's all mechanical. Now, again, this is important because we've got, you know, there's the two main opposing views. One view is, is that it's all material. We are material boys and girls in a material world. The other view is, of course, you know, classic dualism, which you'll we'll see with Descartes, that we have a, you know, soul or spirit. <clears throat> and Hobbes is laying out the materialist view. So memory, thought, etc., is all purely mechanical. There is no soul, there is no spirit. And of course, this is a direct predecessor to modern materialism, that the mind, you, your mind, is that mechanism, that lump of gray stuff. Now, another thing that philosophers have long been interested in is the distinction between humans and things that aren't humans, no, animals. What separates us from animals? Now, one of the classic views is, of course, that we have souls, animals don't. And there's a... There's, of course, an interesting Facebook meme about a battle between two churches about whether dogs have souls or not. It's pretty funny. And the one church offers to, you know, free soul for your dog if you join our church. But, you know, one of the classic views is that humans have souls, animals don't. That's what distinguishes us from animals. Now, does Hobbes think that we have souls? No. So that can't be what separates us from badly drawn dogs. Because, you know, we've got a brain, and they've got a brain, we're mechanical, they're mechanical, and so that distinction, you know, for Hobbes doesn't exist. So then, how do we separate humans from animals? I mean, there's the obvious physiology, but one question is, which has bothered people quite some time, what makes us, you know, special? Language. Yeah, language. We talk, things that talk are people, things that don't talk are not. Now, interestingly, importantly enough, this test, the language test, has been made fairly famous. There was a movie recently uh, called The Invitation Game about a fellow named Turing. The fame, if you're into sci-fi at all, you've probably heard of the classic Turing test, which is really stolen from our good dead friend Descartes, which is this. <laughs> How do you tell? And, and here's the Turing test. Uh, we'll bring it up to modern day. Suppose you're texting with two, well, we can't say people, but you're texting to, say, Dick and Jenny. And your challenge is you're told that one of them is a computer and one of them is a human, but you're only allowed to text with them. You have to have, ask them questions. So how do you tell them? Well, you can ask them, are you human? And they'll both say, Yes, because the idea is to pass as human. If you saw ex machina, similar sort of similar sort of deal, try to figure out this thing. Now, if you can't tell, and they both you know they both hold conversation perfectly normally, perfectly intelligently, then you know under Turing's test, it passes that Turing test that it uses language appropriately. You can't tell the the difference. Now for Descartes, he came up with kind of the original test. Whatever talks uses language appropriately, has a mind, is intelligent. 
Now, the reason why this is important, especially today, is this. One of the things that is big in the tech field is artificial intelligence. Google is trying to build cars that drive themselves. They'll be artificial intelligent. And of course, the military is trying to build you know, kill bots that will kill on their own, because hey, what can go wrong with kill bots? And we're also trying to build artificial intelligence for other purposes as well. And so one of the questions is, how do we know when we've achieved that? And kind of the standard in the field is by talking to it. And if it talks just like we do, then we'd have to say it's intelligent like us. And there's also the moral concern, because in, um, in the movies and cartoons, one thing that I noticed even as a kid was they were always like killing robots. And the idea was, hey, it's an intelligent robot, but it's okay to kill it because it's mechanical. And I thought, that's kind of, you know, it's still kind of evil because it, it's still intelligent. Just because it's not made out of meat like we are, it's still kind of meat. And so we want to know when we build things, do they have moral status? Because if something talks like us, then it could be a person like us, which means we have to treat it differently than we treat like a toaster or a phone, hopefully. So Hobbes' view is, since there's no soul, what separates us from animals, we use language, they don't. I mean, he was well aware that they do make noises and so forth, but we talk, they don't talk. And of course, what we're trying to do now, we're trying to build machines that do the, the talky thing. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, the smart money says it kills us all. So spoiler alert, Google kills us all. That's how it ends. Now, In addition to the question of language, how do we talk, how does that work? So for Hobbes, talking is purely mechanical. Why is that important? Well, if we're just biological machines, that means that we could possibly build machines that also talk, because we're just, we're just meat machines. Now, what if you have to have a soul to talk? Could we build a soul? Probably not. <laughs> but if talking is purely mechanical, it becomes an engineering problem. You just have to build something that can talk. If talking requires a soul, that's a metaphysical problem. So it may not be, you know, we may not be able to build souls. But we probably could build artificial brains. Now another point of concern that's bedeviled philosophers and others for quite some time is this. It's called the problem of universals. And I know about this because I wrote my dissertation on it. If you ever have trouble sleeping, I'd be happy to send you a copy of it and I'll put you out like that. But don't overdose. I think a fatal dose is like six pages, so no more than six pages. Maybe seven. Now the problem of universals is this. Put in sort of abstract terms, is the question of, in virtue of what, is an individual a member of a type, member of a group? So in virtue of what, are all cats cats? Are all tables tables? Are all people people? And at first glance, it seems like a stupid problem. We know what makes cats cats. We know what makes tables tables. But then we really think about it, the good question is, but how do we do that? I mean, if you take, uh, if you take like a human, and you give them, give, you have a room full of cats or pictures of cats, we're pretty good at sorting out the pictures. Because we, there's not we recognize you know, what all cats have in common or what all people have in common. And so the practical aspect of the problem is how do you group individuals into categories? We're pretty good at that. Now there's also a metaphysical problem here. In virtue of what are cats cats? In virtue of what are tables tables? They go on way back to one of the early philosophers, there's a dead guy, uh, wasn't dead then, called Plato. And he believed that there were universals. There was what, they, what he called, or what we call, Platonic forms. So in the Platonic heaven, they'd be like the form of cat. To use an analogy, here's the idea. Does anyone remember CDs? <laughs> Gotta check. Because no one remembers eight tracks, right? Technology changes quick. Now, 
When they made CDs, they of course didn't have the original, and they would either call it Golden Gold. They make literally a gold, you know, the, sort of the real, the original version. And of course, all the other CDs are just copies of that. And so the forms are like that original CD, you know, the, the master CD, and all of this stuff are copies of it. Or you can use the example of photocopies. You have the original and your photocopy. So for Plato, what would make all cats cats is that they are imitations of the form of cat. It's a metaphysical, timeless, eternal entity. I know, kind of weird. And so Plato's view is that universals are real. They're metaphysical entities. Now, for the folks who believe that universals are real, they're called realists. Not like in the um, not like in the political sense, where somebody is like a realist versus like an idealist about like human nature or whatever. But in the sense they believe there really are universals. So if you take all these tables, a realist about universal would say, in addition to the individual tables, there is the universal table that binds them all together. And yeah, that sounds really weird because it is really weird. Now, there are other thinkers who said, that is really, that is really just too weird. We can't, we can't be a party to that level of weirdness. And what they embraced was called nominalism. And nom, it's not like nom nom nom, like eating something. It's nom, like in nom de plume or name. So their view is, what groups all things together is not a metaphysical entity, because that's just crazy as hell, but what all things have in common that are grouped together is the name. Why are all cats cats? Because we call them cats. Or in Spanish, gato, or gato. Similarly, all tables are tables because we call them tables. Or in Spanish, <laughs> So, yeah, we just, we just group things by words. All what all things in common is the words. They're grouped together. Now, Hobbes falls into the class of nominalism. If you, ask, if you were to ask Hobbes back when he was alive, are there these weird metaphysical universals? He'd say, no, that is too weird. What groups things together is the names. And so, what we do, according to Hobbes, in terms of reasoning, is we use the names of things. And so reasoning for him essentially is about the language. We're talking about essentially our terms, their definitions, and whether things fit or don't. For example, if we take cat, or gato, and if you believe in universals, you'd say, well, what makes all cats cats is they somehow participated in the universal cat. Hobbes would say, we have our definition of cat. You know, cat is, you know, however it's defined. And these things are cats because they meet our definition. If something meets the definition, then it is a cat. So it's all about the words. Now, there are all sorts of interesting implications in ethics and politics about universals versus nominalism. One example is this. Two areas of concern in politics are, of course, race and, uh, and gender. And one view is, is that those are real categories. If you were to you know, look at reality, there really is gender, there really is race. They're real things. Another view is, is that they're social constructs. We make up those categories. And so it does have you know, real world implications. Are there real categories of race and gender? Or are we just making up words and it's just the words we apply to them? Because if it's all nominalism, we can change the words. We're just making stuff up. It's in a way make, I mean, there's very real consequences, but it's essentially make, make believe. And so this is an area where the abstract philosophy really does impact reality very, very strongly. 
Now, so Hobbes thinks that when we reason about stuff, we reason about, you know, the words. We, well, tying back to the, you know, the language stuff. Again, one of the core debates about empiricists versus rationalists is this. The empiricist thinks that whatever you know about the world has got to come to the senses. The rationalist believes that you can do it by pure reason. So empiricist, senses, rationalist, you can know things by pure reason. Hobbes believes that our reasoning only gives us conditionals. That, you know, it doesn't tell us what is, it just tells us a conditional. If this, then that. And, so, and we also have to figure this out, you know, empirically. I mean, to use one concrete example, by, by, well, it's a stupid example, but by pure reasoning, can you know how many keys I have in my pocket? No, the only way to tell is, you know, to take them out and count them. But we can, we can reason about stuff correctly. For example, if we know that if I have six keys in my pocket, then I have more than three keys. We know that. But we don't know how many keys I got in my pocket by pure reason. So we can have conditional knowledge that's based on pure reason. Like, for example, if I put my hand on the board, you know you don't know what's behind there. You know, if I've drawn something or not, you'd have to look. But you'd know that if it is a triangle, it's got how many sides? Three. Yeah, three. You can know that by reasoning, but you can't know what's behind the hand until you, you look. So Hobb divides it up into, you know, you can know what's real by empirical means, and the other type of knowledge is just conditional. You know that if it's a triangle, it's got three sides. If I have six keys, then I have more than three. If I have 20 keys, I have less than 100, that type of stuff. And so he's laying out like what type of stuff we can do. Now, another important and interesting area of philosophy, and one of the classic problems in philosophy and religion is this. Determinism versus free will. Now, the key question there is basically this. Are we free? That is to say, do we actually make choices? Or is it deterministic? In other words, is everything we do not a matter of choice? And I'll, this can be illustrated you know, in a straightforward manner. You can think of determinism, it's like being in a play where you cannot deviate from your lines. You just, you're just compelled, or, or we can use a video game analogy. If determinism is true, life is like the cut scene in the video game. It just plays out. Except, of course, in life, we don't realize that we're in a cut scene, everything has just happened. If we have free will, it's like being able to play the game. You're in control. I mean, you don't get to control everything, but you're making choices. You can go this way, that way, choose A, choose B, etc. And so one of the big questions in philosophy and religion, etc., is that question. Are we free or not? Now, some people try to throw in the option of maybe it's all, you know, maybe it's random. But of course, random doesn't mean that you're free. Why? Well, easy to illustrate. Suppose there are seemingly two choices, A or B. You go left or you go right. Now, if determinism were true, then it's already set whether you go A or B. Again, it's like cutscene. You know, you're, you, you see, you know, you're, you're like paused at the split in the road, but of course you don't actually make a choice, you just, that's what it's going to be. Free will is that somehow you're able to pick. You could just, you could pick A, you could pick B, it's not not set. Randomism, or the view that everything is random, you know, quantum, blah, 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 that doesn't give you freedom either because that is just like rolling a die. You know, you don't pick, you just roll. And so that's not free either. So what's Hobbes' view? Well, Hobbes, he was going with the best physics of his time, which is deterministic physics, which means for those that physics, 
there was neither chance nor choice. Everything, again, to use my video game analogy, reality is like the cutscene. Everything just, just plays out. So if one thing happens, it inevitably leads to another, like a, like a machine. And the popular, one popular view among thinkers of this time was a clockwork reality that God built you know, the universe like a clock. And the clock just ticks away the hours. Except in this case, we're all part of the clock. So Hobbes' view, his answer is this. It's a deterministic world. Everything you do is determined by the mechanical workings of the body, just like a, just like a clock or a machine. A clock doesn't have free will, neither do we. So all our behavior is not a matter of free choice. We do what we do for the same reason essentially that clocks do, or stars or whatever. It's just a mechanical process. Now, we do think that some of the stuff we do is voluntary. For example, our heartbeat we know is involuntary. It just does what it does. But we think we control other stuff, like I think I control what I'm going to say next. I could say aardvark next, or echidna, or sasquatch. You know, we, think we, we, have, we think we have freedom. But Hobbes' view is this. Well, I guess I'll put as a question. Why do we think we're free? You know, what, what do we sort of feel that makes us feel free? Like, suppose you get a tough choice to make. What, what does freedom feel like in that regard? Yeah, you feel like you're being pulled one way or the other, but eventually you feel like you pick, you pick one. You make the decision. You make the call. Now, so Hobbes has to explain that. He has to explain how we seem to deliberate. It could be like a small case. You know, you're at the, you know, the restaurant or Starbucks or something, trying to decide between one thing and another. And we think we finally make a choice. You know, you go with the pizza as opposed to the hamburger, for example. Now, Hobbes explains it this way. He says, and this, uh, of course, later becomes part of you know, desire, reverse, and psychology. His view is kind of this. If we're choosing between, say, two options, it seems like we're choosing. And I'll use a metaphor to illustrate it. Imagine the two choices are like powerful magnets. And there is um, like a metal object being pulled by them. Or we could use an analogy like in physics. You know, we got two, we got you know some planets, and we got an object, you know, flying through space. Now it may seem to us like we're delivering between them, choosing one thing or another. Likewise, if there is, um, well, you can imagine, yeah, like two magnets. Imagine like a really boring, stupid game. You have two big magnets, and you get like a you know ball bearing that rolls around, and you have to bet which one it goes towards. Now, do we think the ball bearing is free and it's making choices? No, whichever magnet is stronger, whichever it's closer to, it gets pulled to. And Hobbes believes that what seems like deliberation to us is that we have two or more things that have strong pull, so to speak. And we're, we're being pulled different ways, just like the ball bearing or you know, object in space. But, in the case of, say, physics, does the ball bearing choose where it goes? Yeah, the stronger force wins, even though there may seem to be some like wobbling and resistance. Likewise, according to Hobbes, whatever, you, whatever desire is stronger, or aversion is stronger, wins ultimately. So it feels like you're choosing, because it feels like you're, you could go either way, but Hobbes' view is it's already, it's already you know, set. Whichever one is stronger wins. So when you, we think we're choosing between pizza and the burger, when you choose pizza, we didn't really choose. We, pizza was stronger. And so deliberation is just like that wobble. It seems like we're choosing, but we're not. So for Hobbes, we're not free. And now, of course, this is important because it has all kinds of implications for morality and ethics. If we're not free, you know, well, to use a 
an example. If a tree falls on you in the forest, is the tree arrested for assault? Mm -hmm. Why not? Is it a tree? Yeah, it's a tree. It doesn't choose what it what it does. Now, if we don't choose what we do, we're like that tree. You know, if someone like stabs somebody, they're not choosing to stab someone. They're like that tree. They just happen to be, you know, stabbing. <laughs> That's just the way things had, had to be. And so it changes our view, you know, if we accept determinism, our view of morality changes. None of us in a way are morally responsible because we couldn't do anything different. We're like the tree following the forest on, on somebody. It just happens. So what's Hobbes' view of ethics? Well, he runs into the classic problem, namely, how do you reconcile ethics with determinism and materialism? Now, Hobbes' view is this. When doing ethics, one important step is figuring out, like, what are people like? And this is Hobbes' view of people. He thinks, or thought, because he's really dead now, that we are hedonistic egoists. What does that mean? Well, if someone's a hedonist, what do they like? Oh, pleasure. A person's an egoist means they believe in self-interest. They look out for themselves first, last, always, and only. So what Hobbes' view is is that each of us we are motivated solely by our own self-interest. And what we're interested in is getting pleasure and avoiding pain. Now, and this is just the way we're, we're wired. So for Hobbes, you know, we have pleasure, we have pain. We want to avoid this. We want to seek that. And so all that we do is a matter of avoiding pain, seeking pleasure. And we're only concerned about our ourselves, or so we friends. Now that's a psychological hypothesis, descriptive. That's what people are like. Now because of this, Hobbes believes that there's really no sense in saying what people should do. There's merely saying what people do. What people will do is seek pleasure and avoid pain. So one of the pretty clearly saw one of the implications of the implications of no free will and strict materialism. Namely, people do what they do and they call pleasure good and pain bad. But this whole thing about you know free choice and so forth, that's all essentially nonsense. It's material world, it's deterministic, you know, mechanical. Now Interestingly enough, at this point, Hobbes should have you know, probably just said, well, it's all deterministic, you know, done. Because, well, I'll use an analogy. Suppose you're watching someone playing a video game. It's in a cutscene. Does it make any sense to shout advice at a person while the cutscene is playing? Like, no, no, don't go into the cave. No, because, or in a movie. Does it make sense to shout at the screen advice? No, no, don't go into the cave. The monster's in there. No, because what, what effect is your shouting going to have? Yeah, none, because the movie's already set. The cutscene is that you can't, you can't change it. So giving advice to a movie or a cutscene is pointless because if it's going to play, play out that way, advice makes no sense. So it seemed, you know, given Hobbes' view, we should just say, I've described how things are, that's it. But he gives advice. In fact, the thing that Hobbes is best known for is giving advice. Specifically this. Now, Hobbes' main claim to fame, in addition to just you know having a cool name, Tommy Hobbes, is it's like he'd be like a rock star or something, or a superhero. Yeah, probably you know, probably alternative rock star. Tommy Hobbes, David Bowie. Guy just died recently. Bad day for music, bad, bad month for music so far. At least old musicians. Now, 
the thing he's most known for is his view of politics in his classic work, The Leviathan. Now, the basis of his view is this. Hobbes was Hobbesing during the English Civil War. And that battle was over, well, based on the following issues, a bit simplified. The um, British government consists of what? What do they got? How is their show run over there? Yeah, you get a prime minister, you get a yeah, you get a parliament, our congress is kind of like that. And back then you had like a, a king who actually did some, you know, some king. So you had, uh, you know, those areas of authority. Now, during the English Civil War, there's a battle over whether there'd be a Protestant limited monarchy with a strong parliament versus the Catholic absolute monarchy with a weak parliament. It's kind of like the battle we still have now, you know, Congress versus you know, President, except with less beheadings, typically. Now, civil wars are often the most brutal fight there is. And so his experience in civil war led him to the following conclusions. First, if there is not a strong government, there is chaos. Secondly, chaos is the worst thing there is. The way to prevent chaos is strong government. Anything's better than that. So what Hobbes wanted to do, his mission objective was this. Crudely put, he wants to avoid chaos. He literally wants to save the world. Now the problem, of course, is this kind of disconnect. Because Hobbes has said it's all deterministic. Everything happens just as it does. There's literally there's nothing you can can do. It just is what it is. But he wants to provide a solution. And so going back to my analogy, he's like a person yelling at you while you're playing a video game during the cutscene. It's like, well, there's nothing I can can do. Except on his view, everything is a cutscene. He's screaming advice at the, the movie, the screen, which would be you know, pretty stupid. So given his own view, what he's doing seems nonsensical. If you think everything is determined, giving people advice on what to do doesn't make any, any sense. But he does anyways, because we can't help it. So what he's trying to do is this. He wants to look at the nature of people, you know, the mechanical nature of people, and determine what it would take in order to solve that problem, to bring order out of chaos to save the world. So in some ways, it's kind of like Ultron, you know, an age of Ultron. He really does want to just save the world. Although, given his own views, it's kind of, kind of crazy. But here you go. Now, to make it happen, this is what he does. So, problem. Chaos. Which involves, of course, war. Which is all bad. And so Hobbes wants to find a way to bring about order, to justify political authority. Because one of the transitions in this time was this. For the most part in human history, rulers have justified their power. Well, one common way was kind of really old school, is the ruler would claim to be a god or the child of a god. You know, the pharaohs. Um, many of the Roman you know, rulers, Alexander the Great, they either claim to be gods themselves or the children of the gods. Now, once you get Christianity, can a Christian king claim to be God? He says, hey, I'm God. No, nah, because that's blasphemy. Can they claim to be the son of God? No, nah, because this only, you know, it's Jesus. Uh, can't, that can't work out. And so they can't be God or the son of God. So they have to go with the third best thing, which is that God has appointed them to divine, you know, divine love. Now, during this time, people were finding divine right less <coughs> convincing. And so what was needed was a new justification. So people were no longer, for the most part, buying the idea that well, God says I'm king, so I'm king. So you need a new justification of political authority. And so what the thinkers of this time came up with was an intriguing device 
called the state of nature. Here's the idea. The state of nature is a state, hypothetical or actual, in which there is no political authority. There's no government, there's no courts, there's no police, there's just people in the wild, in the state, literally the state of nature. Now there's some debate among the thinkers whether this is historically true or not, whether this is a real story of how it happened. But they don't actually need it to be an historical account. Because they're looking at is what would justify going from everyone being equal, no kings, no queens, no police, no dukes, no duchesses, no disparities of ranks or laws, to, of course, what we have in all societies, a pyramid, with some people on top and everyone else, you know, at the bottom. What justifies political authority? Now, so what's the state of nature like? Well, here's some metaphors illustrating it. One would be, if you like the historical account, it's like when humans first became human. Here's like, and we're running around like, you know, wild beasts, except we can talk. And there's no kings or queens or anything because we just showed up, you know, it's day zero. You know, there we are. Another way to look at it is, um, you can look at it in terms of, we well, can do some, you know, science fiction or horror setting. Think of like uh, post-apocalyptic scenarios. You know, like, if you like zombies, like The Walking Dead. Everything's collapsed. There is no more authority. You know, there's no more police. There's just survivors. No government. Or you could go with like a, a Mad Max style scenario where, you know, there's no government except or there's just people, you know, driving real fast in the desert, making things blow up. And so you don't have any, any government. Or you could have like a, uh, the classic novel, which I'm sure everyone is forced to read, uh, Lord of the Flies. You know, kids are stranded on an island, there's no adults, it falls into chaos. So what Hobbes is asking us to imagine is, imagine a state of nature with no government, no authority. A final illustration would be um, deathmatch mode in video games. That's the mode where everybody's fighting everybody. There are no sides. Everyone's trying to kill everybody. And that's pretty state of nature. Now, Hobbes thinks, of course, this is pretty bad. Because, well, in that state of nature, well, I guess you could put it as a question. Deathmatch is cool in video games because you don't actually die for real. But would deathmatch be fun in real life? Would it be fun to like, I think like the Hunger Games, you know, for real. Yeah, yeah, it's not fun. I mean, it's cool to watch the movies. Like, go get them, Katniss, and her new ally, you know, Donnie's. And it's cool to play a video game, you know, Halo or you know, something. But yeah, real life, you know, being thrown into an arena with you know some some sticks and said you know, beat each other to death, uh, that's less less awesome. And so we realize that that scenario, you know, Hobbes says we, we realize that scenario is awful because it, it sucks, you know, it's death, you know, we don't have nice stuff, etc. But we're sort of caught in a problem because according to Hobbes, we're all selfish, we just care about ourselves, which creates the problem because we're in competition, we're fighting, we want everything. Now, so how does Hobbes try to get us out of this? Well, he talks about natural laws. During this time period, and of course today, natural laws are a big thing. Now, Hobbes doesn't or didn't believe in God. What some thinkers saw the problem is, you know, by God. God lays down the moral rules, he lays down the order, provides justification, you know. So if you believe in God, you've got a pre-built, you know, moral system. God. But if you haven't got God, where do you get the, the laws, the rules? Well, natural laws. One thing that's pretty interesting is even today, of course, scientists talk about natural laws. They don't want to say, you know, laws of God, because typically they're atheists, but you've got to have laws about how things work. So we normally think of natural laws as things like, well, like the laws of physics and chemistry, you know, descriptions of gravity and so on. But Hobbes, one of his innovations was what works in the sciences, like physics and biology, should also work in politics. Because if we're all if they're all mechanical systems, then there should be laws governing politics as well. 
And here are the laws he thinks exist. First law, don't die. Survive. So law number one is you are obligated to survive. What's the basis for that? Well, Hobbes says reason tells us that dying is bad, which seems true. So law number one, survive. Now part of that, he says the following. From this, we get certain rights. So the mission objective is don't die. But we have to have the right to make that mission possible. And so what comes out of this is what Hobbes calls the right to all things. So objective, do not die. That's how you win. And of course, in order to win, you've got to be able to use any means that are necessary, the right to all things. And so in Hobbes' state of nature, again, he was anticipating you know, deathmatch video game, or like an arena or like 100 games. It's like we're all in a big arena called you know, the world, and we got to survive. Now, if your goal is simply to not die, what do you do? Yeah, survive using whatever it takes. And so everything that's out there is something you can use. Because Hobbes argues, if you have a right to try to, you know, and his right is not a right to life. It's a right to try to survive. If you have a right, the right is useless unless you have the means to act on that right. For example, if you have the right to vote, but you can't actually vote, that right is useless. If you have the right to try you know, to survive, but you don't have the right to use the means, the right is useless. So you get a right to everything. So in, in the state of nature for Hobbes, there is no individual property in the following sense. Whatever you can grab and onto is yours. But you don't have a, dis a, a distinct right to it. Everyone else has a right to it as well. And so the way you settle ownership is, well, there's an old saying that what is 90% of ownership? Possession. So it's yours as long as you can hold on to it. And again, going with the um, video game example, it's like the weapons in a you know, first-person shooter. You know, we're competing against everybody. If you grab the sniper rifle, it's yours. Until someone else kills you and takes it, then it's theirs. Until someone kills them and takes it, then it's theirs. And so we have a right to everything, and we're competing like that. Now, if it's just people fighting people, and everyone has a right to everything, and we're all trying to survive, what's going to happen? No, what happens in the Hunger Games? In the movie. In the actual game. Yes, everybody dies except one person. And even that's not really much of a win because if you're the only one left alive, you're like, yay, I win. You know, I just die alone and sad. <laughs> so Hobbes has got to have a solution because he knows that, that that chaos and murderification is not what we really want. But we're in a bit of a bind. Here's the bind. Hobbes' view, again, is that we're all selfish. I just care about me, me first, me last, me always, me only. And everyone else is the same way. We only care about gain, getting stuff, and glory, being praised and thinking about ourselves. And so you can't trust me, I can't trust you. So we can envision a state of nature scenario. Suppose, um, suppose we're, on a, uh, we're on a ship. Or on a boat, and it gets uh, you, know, you know. We can do like oh, we do like the Lord of Flies scenario. We're on a plane, we crash it on. We're all there, you know, and we're like Hobbes says we are. We're all just selfish, selfish people who care about ourselves. And there's like you know this food and there's like one rifle. Now, if we're as horrible as Hobbes says, I want to kill you, and you want to kill me, and we want to take all because that way you get all the food, you get all the stuff, you know, put up with people. But we also realize that if we fight with each other, we're going to kill each other off. So we have that problem. We don't want to, we you know, don't like each other, we don't care about each other, we just care about ourselves. But we're smart enough to realize that if we don't, you know, we just fight, we'll all die. Now, but here's the problem. Suppose we have, the, we have like one rifle, 
and there's like dangerous animals on the island. And I say, oh, you know, you all look pretty tired. Give me the rifle. I'll watch over your wife's sleep, and you can take a watch. Now, if we're as bad as Hobbes says, what's going to happen to see you fall asleep? Yeah, I'm going to kill you all. Nothing personal. You do the same to me. That way I get all the food. But then I'll be sad and lonely because I'll be on the island all alone. And the animals eventually you know, kill me. And so I'm kind of torn because I want to kill everybody, you know, because <laughs> I'm awful. You want to kill everybody because you're awful. But we realize it's got a result that, you know, it's, it's against, against your interest to kill us all. But you really want to kill us all. So Hobbes' solution is this. Since we can't trust each other, he says what we need to do is appoint what he calls the sovereign. And the sovereign could be a single person, could be a king, could be a council, could be a parliament, could be a congress, could be a board, could be whatever. He doesn't specify like the exact form. But what we do is we hand over to the sovereign our right to kill each other. So essentially, in effect, say, okay, I won't kill you, you don't kill me, we'll appoint a ruler and give the ruler the right to kill anybody. And in return, what the ruler does is this. The ruler will hurt people who break the agreements. So if we form an agreement to give somebody the rifle and say, okay, you're our enforcer, you make sure people behave. And we, we agree to divide the food up a certain way. We agree that instead of like a right to all things, each person gets a certain allocation of food. All the food isn't everybody's, the food is divided up now. And if someone like tries to grab the food, the sovereign or the sovereign's agent hurts them or, or kills them. And so he thinks that's how we solve that problem. We put somebody or somebody's in charge, we hand over our power to kill, we give our right to all things, and the sovereign, the sovereign's agents, keep us in love. Now, of course, it's a bit of a problem, because if we're all selfish weasel bastards, and the sovereign's one of us, what's the sovereign going to be like? You know, selfish weasel bastard, too. So the sovereign's going to try to get away with stuff, too. They're going to be, you know, you know, corrupt and so on. So what keeps the sovereign in check? Yeah, that if a sovereign pushes it too much, we'll kill the sovereign, appoint a new one. And so he believes the sovereign will be, you know, probably tyrannical. But again, going back to the beginning, his view is that the worst thing is chaos. And so even the worst tyranny is better than chaos which is an argument people even make to this day. For example, we, um, when Saddam Hussein was in power, people asked, what could be worse than Saddam Hussein? And we found out what could be worse than Saddam Hussein. ISIS is worse than Saddam Hussein. Similarly, when we uh, bumped off Gaddafi, we asked, what could be worse than Gaddafi? And the answer is, ISIS is worse than Gaddafi, or what we got now. And so, in a way, you can see that as Hobbes' you know, support for Hobbes' argument. The worst tyrant is better than chaos. So if you have a choice between tyranny and chaos, tyranny is the better choice, or so we claim. So that's his view. Essentially, the way we form government is we wish to avoid chaos. We appoint a government and put in agents of punishment you know, courts and so forth, in order to maintain order. And this is one of Hobbes' major, I mean, today it seems like, well, yeah, this is obvious. You have some people in charge, you get laws, you get punishment. But this is where the theor theoretical foundation of a modern politics is being laid down. And so one of Hobbes' major contributions is this notion and justification for power. So what justifies power? The ability to maintain order. Now, also going along with this is the question of, you know, moral rights. And here's his answer to that. So what we do basically is we form what's called a social contract. And this gives rise to what we now call to this day social contract theory. The idea is, is that government 
is an agreement, a contract between the people. And today, of course, this seems obvious because that's what we've got in the United States, and it's kind of a standard view. But at one time, this was the radical view. Because it used to be, you know, whoever, whoever claimed to be God, or the Son of God, was in charge. So we have the idea that we create a contract between us. We agree to appoint a sovereign to run the show. Now, what about rights and morality? Well, here's the answer to that. Hobbes' view is that the right you have, well, you get to keep a right no matter what. You have the right to try to not die. And so if something tries to kill you, you always have the right to try to kill it right back, which is only polite. But all the other rights we have come from the sovereign. They're all what we call artificial rights. So whatever the government says you have as a right is the right you have. Now this could range from what we have in the United States, a whole bunch of rights, to places that have very few and limited rights, like our ally Saudi Arabia, for example, has very limited rights relative to arms. What about morality? Well, Hobbes' view is known as legalism, or sometimes called legal positivism. One of the standard questions in ethics is, what makes things good and bad? And Hobbes' answer is very straightforward. You want to know what's good? You look at the law books. You want to know what's bad? You look at the law books. So legal equals good. And you know, illegal equals bad. So his view is, is that the state decides what rights people have, the sovereign decides, with one exception of that right of like, you know, someone tries to kill you, try to kill them right back. And what's good or bad is set by the state. Now, one appeal of this is you don't have to get into like weird, funky metaphysics or big debates because you want to know what rights you have, the state tells you. You want to know what's good and bad, the state tells you. But of course, there are some problems, namely this. Do we believe that governments can have evil laws? Yeah. And so, if you believe there's a morality independent of government, independent of law, you wouldn't find this appealing, because this doesn't give you grounds for morally criticizing the government. Now, it does give you grounds if you disagree with the sovereign, you can kill them and take over or force them out, but it doesn't give you moral grounds for saying the sovereign is wrong, because, crudely put, for Hobbes, might is right. If you don't like, you know, what they claim is right, you take over. But again, it does have a certain appeal. There's no funky metaphysics, there's no, you know, weird debatey stuff. It's just, you want to know what's, what rights you got? You look at the law books. You want to know what's good and bad, you look at the laws. But if you believe that people have rights you know, against the government, and that there's a moral foundation to criticizing the government, then Hobbes' view would not be particularly appealing in this regard. So how did Hobbes' view go over back in the day? Well, like many thinkers, he wasn't like super accepted in his own time. The people who believed in the, the monarchy, they thought, you know, this is not particularly dignified. You know, a tyrant picked out of fear and desperation. Also, those who supported like a democratic view with like rights and morality thought picking a tyrant out of desperation was sort of problematic. Despite that though, Hobbes has been hugely influential in political philosophy. Even to this day, when people discuss, you know, justification of authority, political situations, Hobbes is always part of the conversation. And even, even now in 2016, when people are talking about like Libya, Iraq, ISIS, etc., Hobbes gets into the discussion. You know, the argument about you know, what justifies authority and would it be better off just having you know, order even at the price of 
bacteria. Last thing, problems. He has impact and the problems. Impact. First, psychology. His theory of psychology and perception provided the foundation for modern investigations into um, psychology and neuroscience. He's laying out, he's not the only or, first, or necessarily the first person to do this, but he's part of the theoretical foundation for scientific empirical epistemology. So if you take a class today like in neuroscience or the you know, you know, physiology of perception, it does trace, it might not mention Hobbes, but it traces back to Tommy Hobbes and these kind of guys. Second, he was the first person to really try to present a modern materialistic monism. And monism, oh, going back. There's the question of like, how many types of fundamental stuff there is. If you're a monist, it comes from, you know, like mono. And mono is, of course, means, you know, one. Like mono wing or monopoly. And an alternative view is dualism. There, there's two types of stuff. And his particular monism was materialism. So he was sort of the first person to develop a systematic account of, in, the, in the modern era of there being everything is material. So we're material boys and girls in a material world. And modern science is that today. If you go to most you know, scientists today and ask them, yeah, so uh, where's the soul fit in there? They would say, silly rabbit, <laughs> souls are for science fiction or for fantasy. Third, his view that the natural sciences could be a model for psychology, sociology, and political theory is now the standard. Psychology is now a social science. Sociology is a social science, and political science is a science. And so we help shape that. Next. Fourth, he's considered by many to be the founder of modern political science, which sort of ties to the previous one. Fifth, he contributed along with some other thinkers, the idea that the society is a human construction rather than being based on eternal principles or metaphysical foundations. In other words, if you hear today people talking about things like social constructs, like the social construct of gender, or the social construct of race, or the social construct of the economy, he put forth the view that we are literally just making this stuff up which is, it, it may seem like, well, obvious, but it's an important innovation because if you look at our economic system, our legal system, our political system as, we're just making this crap up. It's like a game. You know, we're just making up the rules, like whether you're playing Monopoly or you know, Dungeons & Dragons or Halo, you're just making up rules. And if we're just making it up, that means what? We can change it because it's not laid down by the eternal order of the universe, it's not like physics, where you just gotta deal with it, you could do otherwise. Do we have to have the economic system we do? No, we make that crap up. We could change it. Do you have to have the political system we do? For just making that crap up? No, we could change it. And so it's, an, it's a critical innovation, the idea that we are just making crap up, because if we're making crap up, People can't say, oh, they can say, this is how things must be, it's the eternal order. But if it's just made up, it's make-believe. You can, you can change it. Also, he, like many thinkers of this time, laid forth what we now call individualism. His um, cover of the original Leviathan, it's a pretty interesting cover. It's a giant made up of individuals. And so the sort of the Western modern conception of the state is, is the state is us. We are the state. So the government is not something independent of us that we have to like take back, you know, our country from, from others. We are the country. There is no one to take it back from because it is, as you know, Walt Kelly said, we have met the enemy and it is us. 
And so the idea that the state is a collection of individuals who had a huge impact and still does on Western thought. Also, of course, his idea of the state of nature, social contract theory, etc., are standard stuff. People today, of course, talk about social contracts. We got a constitution. We expect uh, other countries to have constitutions. When people talk about politics, they talk about social contracts. Also, he made contributions, the transition from the theological state to the secular state. Now, of course, if you look at today, with like the rise of ISIS and the rise of you know, extreme conservatism, we're still fighting that, that fight. On one hand, we have the view that the state should be grounded in religion. That is the opposing view the state should not be. And if you look at the um, United States, the presidential you know, competition, we're still having that debate. How much should the state be theologically founded? Now, what about some of the problems? Well, one problem he, he sort of contributes to, which becomes kind of a definitive problem for this whole, whole time period, and becomes the basis for movies like The Matrix and Inception, is this. Bless you. Now, as I mentioned, one view is naive, naive realism. What you see is what you get. And the view put forth by people like Hobbes and others is what's called representational realism. And the idea is this. There's stuff out there in the world, and we see it, but we create ideas. Crudely put, we have like a picture in our head. But here's the problem, and it's an old problem. If what you have in here is just a representation of what's out there, how do you know that what you're experiencing is really out there? How do you know you're not just hallucinating, dreaming, in the matrix, or, or what? How do you know? And as we'll see, our, our next dead guy, Rene Descartes, he tries to beat this problem because it's a pretty, well, from the standpoint of philosophy, it's like the fu a fundamental problem. Before you can even talk about anything else, you have to just figure out, how do I know that there's anything even going on out there? It's not all, not all just in my mind. Next problem, consciousness. Still a problem today. How do, how do we work out an account of our intuitive view of our experience world that we feel, we think, we love, we hate, we feel joy, we feel sadness, with the idea that we're just a mass of neurons, a, a gray lump of neurons sitting in a you know, skull box. So how do we reconcile what science tells us with our lived experience, and perhaps with our faith, if you believe, if you believe in something beyond that? And lastly, Hobbes the determinist, so how do we deal with freedom? having any purpose and values. So in many ways, Hobbes lays out the challenge of materialism. If we're just literally meat machines you know, operating in a mechanical world with no freedom and no purpose and values, how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we address that? If love is just you know, a chemical thing, what does love mean? If loyalty is just chemicals and neurons, what is loyalty? What is hate? All that stuff. And then he died, and he still lived today. It's a problem solved for Tommy Hobbs. So have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you on the first day.